in this episode, I'm going to be talking about when I caught the opposition uh, kissing a uh, boy. And that's important in here because information rules the nation. The more you know about what somebody is doing, the more power that you have over them. And you can get them to pretty much do anything that you want to want them to do. And when I caught this guy, uh, my slave, in the sense that uh, anything that I wanted to do or needed him to do, uh, he had no problem in doing it as long as I kept it secret. I'm going to share that story with you, and I hope you enjoy it. And uh, so, kick back, relax, and uh, enjoy the show. Man, this story, this is a very old story. It happened years ago. Uh, I was at this other institution. This guy, um, I knew him. We worked out. Uh, he was uh, he was a vice lord and a uh, cool dude. You know what I'm saying? Uh, he worked out the same time that I worked out on the ball field every day. But for some reason, uh, he, he decided to not go to the ball field on this particular day. And uh, I didn't either. I didn't go down there because I was waiting on uh, my pack. You know what I'm saying? I had some drugs coming in. So I was waiting on the dude, you know, during the change or what else. Everybody would be out walking. He was going to, you know, my mule, he was going to fade the unit, come in. I get the pack from him. And then I put the pack up. Then I was going to go to the ball field on the next call out. So that's why I was in the unit. But while I was in the unit, uh, I was just walking laps. You know what I'm saying? I didn't want to sit in the in the cell. So I was walking laps in the middle of the, the building, just walking from one end of the building to the other. And as I was doing that, not to be nosy or anything like that, you know, every cell door has a, 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 a window on it. And that window allows the officer to look into the cell without having to open the cell to make sure that you're okay uh, when they make their rounds during count and so on and so forth. But it also allowed uh, other inmates to look inside of a cell, uh, whether they were doing it to be nosy or just because they were passing by the cell. So this day, um, I did not realize that he didn't go to the ball field. I, didn't had, I had no idea that he didn't go to the ball field. I wasn't paying any attention to what anybody else was doing uh, in the building. So uh, while I'm walking my laps and going back and forth, you know, from one end of uh, one part of the building to the other, you know, front of the pod to the back of the pod, and just making a circle, a loop, I'm walking. And I would pass by the sales, and periodically, you know, something would catch my attention out of my peripheral. And when I passed by, this cell that was occupied by this guy that I knew was gay, I saw this dude in there that I knew, I recognized. And when I saw him, uh, he was kissing the boy. I'm talking about they were locked in, in a passionate kiss. I'm talking a passionate kiss. What they had done, though, and it, it didn't work, they had put something up over the window but it has slipped and failed, and they were so involved in this kiss, they didn't even realize that the, the violation had failed from the window. They didn't even realize. So I'm the only one walking laps. So I don't do anything. I keep walking. And I come around again, and lo and behold, they are still kissing. And I don't know what came over me. I don't know why I did it. But when I... Past the cell this time, I got two or three cells past that cell. And I heard somebody come in through the front door. I thought it was my dude, you know, the mule bringing my pack in, right? But it wasn't him. So I don't know why I did it because this dude is in the opposition. I backpedaled to the cell, right? Knocked on the window and said, somebody's in the pod. They looked at me as if 
like they were still hugging when they looked at me. They turned and looked at me. Both of the cheeks side by side. Looking at me. And then they stopped. They broke free from each other. I said, somebody's in the pond, man. I'm talking about the vice lord dude looking at me. His eyes as big as a half a dog. The boy looked at me and was like covered up his mouth like, oh. You know how somebody would put your hand over your mouth be like, oh. Like that. That's what he did. So I just kept walking. So a few minutes later, my mule finally comes in. I get him. We go to the cell. He give me the pack. He steps back outside the cell and sit at the table so he can watch out for me, right? I put the violation up. I break the pack down and do what I need to do. Then I put it in the spot, right? You know what I'm saying? And make sure that uh, my spot was secure and all this. And that. Then I come up out the cell. I was like, look, let's roll. So I grabbed my workout bag and got my workout gear in and all this. And that. You know, my, my ace bandages and stuff like that. I got all that. And we roll out. We walking down to the ball field. So I get down on the ball field and I'm thinking about what I had just seen with this vice lord in the cell uh, kissing this boy. I don't say anything to anybody about it, but I'm just playing it in my mind like, okay, what is it, what's going to come from this? You know what I'm saying? I'm sure dude going to step to me and when he steps to me, you know, what am I going to say? How am I going to play this out? You know, so on and so forth, right? So sure enough, uh, when I got back to the unit, it was about 7 o'clock. I get back to the unit, and here he is. He comes to the cell. He knocks on the door. Joe T., let me holler at you, man. I said, what's going on, man? going on? And he said, man, I need to holler at you. I said, yeah, I bet you do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And uh, he said, can I step in? I said, yeah, come on in, man. Step in. Sit down. He steps in, he sits down, and he's like, man, he said, uh, you going to tell anybody, man, about what you saw? I'm like, nah, why should I tell anybody about what I saw? He's like, man, you know, you you a gangster disciple, I'm, I'm, I'm vice lord. He said, uh, you know, I know ain't no love lost or nothing like that, right? But, you know, I could, you know, if you told anybody about this, man, I can get in trouble for this, man. I'm willing to pay you. Both of us are, you know what I'm saying, for you to just keep your mouth shut. I said, nah, I said, nah, I'm good. I don't need you to pay me nothing, you know what I'm saying? I said, I'm straight. I said, but uh, let me ask you something, though, man. I said, uh, it ain't none of my business. And evidently, they don't know, you know what I'm saying? But, uh, you know, they kill you for that. They catch you doing that, man. They kill you for that. These folks ain't playing about that, man. He was like, yeah, I know, man. And, and he started just giving me free information. He said, yeah, but, you know, we've been messing off for a while, man, and I, and I think I love the boy, and whoop, whoop, this, 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 and that. And I'm looking at him like, I don't even really know what to say to that. You know what I'm saying? He says he thinks he loves the boy. So I'm listening to him, and at the same time, I'm saying to myself, okay, how do I take that information? How do I take that information and use it in a way that uh, benefits me in GD? And I'm looking at him and I say, look, I tell you what, I said, uh, you got to move because I'm always looking for more ways to, you know, get contraband in so I can get my bread, right, at this time. Keep in mind, this is an old story, y'all. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, he was like, yeah, I got to move. I got a good move. I'm like, yeah. I said, let me use the move sometime. He said, I'm the move. I said, you the move? He was like, yeah. He said, I move packs every now and then for, for my brothers and stuff. He said, I can get one in every now and then for you, but not all the time. I said, oh, okay then. I said, that's what's up. I said, and we'll just keep everything, you know what I'm saying, that happened, we'll keep it on the low. He was like, all right. So, a month goes by, two months goes by. I said, I'm going to try this dude and see what's up. I hollered at him. I said, man, can you take care of a pack for me? Where your people at? You know? Yeah, yeah, he was from Knoxville. Yeah, I, it was either Knoxville or Chattanooga. And I, I think I was thinking about it earlier, but it's, it's Knoxville. And that's right where that institution, it's about an hour from the institution that I was at. And he was like, yeah, man, if you can get anybody, man, to meet my people, man, halfway, 
you know, because my people have to come all the way from the middle, you know what I'm saying, the 615, right? That's like down toward Nashville and all this and that, Springfield. He said, if you can get your people to meet halfway, man, I can take care of that for you. I said, all right. So I set up a bond to see if it's going to work. Sure enough, he get the pack, he bring it in to me, right? Everything good. I even tried to pay him out of the pack. He wouldn't take nothing. He just wants me to keep this secret. So now I'm starting to see like, okay, this dude here, he compromised so far, he'll do anything that needs to be done. So once we had an issue where, you know, it was going to be a war between uh, Vice Lords and, and GD. And he wasn't the top dog, but he had some sway with him. You know what I'm saying? So I go holler him. I said, look, man, go on and kill this. Let this be a one-on-one -on -one situation, man. Then we can kill this, man. We don't need to be doing all this and that. You know, so he go, and I'm talking, he campaign hard. He campaign hard, and he get the, he get the head of the vice lords to agree to what I was talking about. I said, oh, yeah, I'm running this now. I'm not only in charge of GD. I done co-opted vice lords. They don't even know it. Because one of their brothers is uh, messing with a boy. And I said all that to say is, when you're in here, people are always looking for an angle to try to control you and how you get down. And if you come into a place like this and you're not confident in who you are and can stand on your own two feet regardless of the circumstances, you're going to find yourself in a situation where you are doing somebody else's bidding, beholden to them. And that is what uh, one of those aspects of being involved in the criminal lifestyle that people don't discuss. How do you become so co-opted to where you're doing somebody else's bidding even though, uh, even though you don't agree with it? Now, the situation that I gave you, the, 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 this episode that I'm talking about, it's a little bit on the extremes. Uh, but just in general terms, you know, if you find yourself in a situation where somebody else is telling you what to do, telling you how to do it, I'm talking about people that do not love you, not your mother, not your father, not your brother, not your sister, not your wife, not your husband. When you find yourself in these situations, especially when I'm talking about as far as the criminal lifestyle or either in prison, you're going to end up doing something one day that you don't agree with that's going to be more trouble than it's worth. When you live in this criminal lifestyle, you have those that lead and those that follow. You have more people that follow than lead. Not that the person that they're following is smarter than them or has more insight into whatever it is that they're about to do, but because this person holds or has information that prevents you from disagreeing with whatever it is that they want you to do. And it can be information about you uh, testifying against somebody. It could be information about you doing something that is not looked upon favorably in the lifestyle that you live, like participating in homosexual activities. Or it could be just that you're scared. And he knows it. And he's going to protect you until he can't. See, the criminal lifestyle is a lifestyle of manipulation and using. That's all it is. And in this situation, I took advantage of that young man's situation. Not because I needed to. Because I wanted to, because that's what the lifestyle had taught me that it's about. Part of it anyway. Manipulating people. Using people. That's what I had learned the whole time that I'm living this gang lifestyle. How to manipulate and use people. To get them to do what you need them, need them to do. Whether you really need them to do it or not. I had my own move. I didn't need him to do anything like that. I could have gone and talked to those brothers in Vice Lord myself, but I didn't. I used him to do it. 
All because I wanted to keep him on the hook. And I think back at the amount of stress that I caused him. The, the trauma that I put him through. Because I held over his head something that he was ashamed of. He didn't want anybody to know. Maybe he wasn't ashamed of it. Maybe it was because he knew that they would kill him or hurt him. Maybe that's what it was. Whatever the reason was, I took advantage of that. And that's what this criminal lifestyle is all about. Eventually, you, if you're living a criminal lifestyle, you're going to find yourself on the wrong end of it. There is no right end to it. No way, no how. Nothing about the criminal lifestyle is right. There's no right way to do wrong. But right now you might find yourself in that situation in a position to where you don't see it that way. But one day, trust me, you're going to find yourself on the end where you are the prey and not the predator. And then you're going to think about all the things that you've done to people. All the harm that you've caused them. What I'm asking you to do is to see that beforehand. See that beforehand and don't wait until you get caught up and it causes you trauma and pain. This lifestyle is not one that anybody should want to live. But I understand that you feel like that this is the best option for you. That's a lie. That's a lie. This brother here, he lived a lifestyle similar to the one that I used to live. So I know the social consequences that he would have had to face. And guess what, y'all? Eventually, he did have to face it. Because it was found out, not from me, but it was found out from his own brothers that he was gay. And when I say to you, they beat him within an inch of his life. Believe it. They beat him so bad that he had to be taken out to the free world hospital. They beat him. All because they thought that what he was doing was wrong. And that's what baffles me about the lifestyle now. When we live a negative lifestyle, we have this illusion of this code of conduct that says what's right and what's wrong. And even though we're doing wrong and causing pain to people, manipulating people, we think that we still have some authority to set up here on this moral high ground and say that what somebody else is doing is wrong. We don't have any right to say anything about what anybody is doing, right or wrong, because we have given up the moral authority that we may have had or could have had by living that lifestyle that we live. But we don't see it that way. I see it now. But I didn't then. And that's what I'm saying to you. Don't live a lifestyle that causes you to lose the moral authority to correct somebody or to give advice. Don't live a lifestyle that is based on manipulation and deceit. Because one day, you might find yourself in a situation where you're the prey. And if you ever do, I don't think you're going to like it. I don't think you're going to like it at all. I hope that this episode has been informative to you. Um, if it has and you like it, leave me a comment. Tell me if you like it. Tell me if you like to hear other stories like this. Share it with your friends. 
I appreciate all the support, y'all. This has been another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker, and I say peace, y'all.